Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Natalie. How are you? Hi, Michael. I'm doing fine today. Thank you. How are you going? I'm really good, thank you. Thank you for asking. Yeah, not that many <laughs> guests actually ask me. <laughs> so that's really good. Thank you. I'm 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 really jealous because I know you're in Spain, <laughs> so it's nice and warm. And uh, I'm in the UK. We're, we're supposed to be having a better week this week, but I just uh, not so long ago took the dog for a walk, and it's it's not cold, <laughs> it's not raining but it's really gray and cloudy. It's so bizarre, you know, our summer. Um, uh, well, I, I guess everybody's summer is bizarre at the moment, right? I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been very hot here. It has been yeah. very hot. So I'm looking forward to when the weather cools down a bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've heard the report. So, uh, you know, we feel it. I mean, the UK, you know, UK people always want to travel to hot countries, but uh, we couldn't cope with those kind of temperatures either in the 40s. <laughs> Celsius, my God, that's just mad. It's, mad. Yeah, it is very hot. It's not pleasant. And I don't think many people here really enjoy it either. We, hence, there are siestas. So you actually have a break from the heat and you stay indoors. Yeah. yeah. It's very sensible, isn't it? It's yeah. very sensible indeed, which I bet all the UK people will be out. <laughs> In the sunshine, <laughs> in the heat. yeah, burning, burning. <laughs> anyway, lapping it up. About, yeah, enough about <laughs> the weather. Um, we're here to to listen to your story. So, um, I'll start with the opening question that I ask all my guests, which is, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about yourself, Natalie. Where were you born? Have you moved around? What a little bit about your education? What about your first job? You know, what kind of career have you had? If indeed mm -hmm. you have, not everybody mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. And then how did you get to what you're doing today? And then we can really learn more about that because you do some fascinating work and I'm very interested to hear about it. Over mm. to you, Natalie. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Well, I was born in Switzerland and um, my family still lives there. I haven't lived there in 20 years. Wow. I left quite young. I moved to Australia when I was 19 years old. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, um, the plan was for me to be in Switzerland, to study business. And I did that for one year. And it just felt like it wasn't me. Mm. <laughs> so my parents wanted and you know in, in many ways it made sense but it just was not for me it just didn't feel right yeah. and I've been to Australia before so I just had this longing to 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 go back and just have 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 adventure so I did I um, quit my business um, education without my parents really approval and yeah. did some side work saved up some money packed up and moved to Australia and um, then they realized that was really real. <laughs> That's what she wants. And then they kind of, you know, became supportive, which I'm very grateful for. So then I did my education in Australia and it was in natural, it was in holistic therapies. And I lived there for 13 years. So in so many ways, <clears throat> it feels like home or a part of me feels Australian. A part of me feels like it's home. And then I um, met my husband, who is British, and right. we moved to Hong Kong together. So we lived there for five years. And yes, yeah, so I've moved around a bit. Definitely. I mean, it, I suppose it makes you appreciate uh, people more, perhaps. I don't know. You get, you get a better sense of the world if you go to different countries. I, I feel that anyway, because I've moved around a little bit too. But can I can I just ask a really, maybe it's a strange question. How did you get a visa to stay there that long? How did, mm. how did you manage that? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, that was tricky. <laughs> that was a fight. <laughs> yeah. So when I was studying holistic therapies, it wasn't recognized. So I did all those studies. And then it was like, okay, well, you finish your studies. Now you have to leave. Right. And I already 
fell in love with the country and I knew it wasn't time for me to go back to Switzerland. So um, I looked at other options and then, you know, another option was just to study further. <laughs> and right. just hairdressing because it was the fastest, <laughs> probably oh. straightforward thing I could do. So I could, because I knew I didn't really want to have, want to have a change of career. So I studied hairdressing and that gave me my visa. Oh my God. <laughs> what, so you got a visa for studying mm. or a visa for becoming a hairdresser? Which for becoming around? a hairdresser. For becoming, for becoming a hairdresser. So it was an op occupation in demand. <gasps> and because it was an occupation in demand, they would then give you permanent residency. What a wonderful idea. Oh mm. my God. Never knew mm. that. Mm. Never knew that. <laughs> that something like that could be possible. Yeah. And whereabouts in Australia were you? Mm, I was in Melbourne. So I lived in Melbourne for four years and then I moved to the Gold Coast, to Queensland. Okay. Wonderful. Mm. Oh, great. Beautiful beaches in the Gold Coast. Yeah, very, very nice, very relaxed lifestyle. So and then when I was living on the Gold Coast, I opened up. So I've been self-employed for 16 years. <laughs> so right. I was always a bit of a rebel. I just knew working for somebody, it's just, yeah, it's just not my thing. And after I studied, I just knew I could, I just started setting up my business. I was wow. like, right, I'm going to get some flyers. I'm going to let people know what I'm doing. And for some reason, it just worked. It just worked because back in those days, marketing was very different. You kind of would just go around. You would yes. let people know what you're doing. Um, do you know anybody who thinks would benefit from me? And um, people in Australia are quite supportive. Right. And if they know somebody, they will send you away or they're happy to advertise your business. And that's I built that relatively fast. So I've been lucky that I've been able to to start yeah start doing what i'm what i love quite quite fast and doing it for myself as well and yeah ever since then i've just been doing my own thing at some point i had a health food cafe as well in australia so that was really great learnings yeah. um i think it was probably my best investment into a business just i mean it cost me a fortune and i didn't really make a lot of money out of it but i learned so much about how to manage people how to start a business from scratch and yeah it just really taught me a lot which was such a valuable lesson and this this kind of desire to be self-employed being entrepreneur you know working for yourself did that come from anywhere say in your family was was you know had somebody else done the same thing that you were inspired by them no. no. <laughs> I mean, my dad came, became self-employed later on. Mm. But, you know, Switzerland is very, I mean, I don't think I would have been able to start a business the way how I did in Switzerland. I don't think it would have been possible. It's just the, no. the system is not structured that way. Australia no. is a lot easier. It's just people are more open-minded. So it yeah. was definitely possible to do that in Australia. Mm. Yeah. Right, yeah. So it's a bit more relaxed, a bit more open, a bit more entrepreneurial yeah. to where Switzerland might be a bit rigid and structured and yeah, yeah and very also linear. free to be able to yeah. do that. Yeah, and also and a lot more expensive as well. Yeah. What were the holistic um, practices, studies that you did and then mm. what yeah. you delivered in your business? Yeah, so I studied herbal medicine and aromatherapy, and then it went pretty soon into, um, I did like a Reiki course, and then that opened up my ability to understand energy. And so my, my work pretty much moved into that direction. So it was um, like holistic herbal medicine combined with energy healing, and then I had the cafe as well. It was a vegetarian cafe. And at the back, I had treatment rooms. So people would come in for psychic readings. They would come and get any kind of therapy that would allow them to feel more connected to themselves. So that's that's been – therapy has always been a part of a part of my passion. And, well, maybe a better word would be helping others has always been a part of my passion. Yeah. yeah. And were those – people that came to the cafe or you know did you 
you know, distribute your flyers and, and then yeah. get people to come? And well, I think the cafe was really great because we had, um, I was on a strip that was quite busy. So we had a lot of walk by traffic. So people will come in and right. they would have healthy food. So they would notice what else was on offer. And uh, we also got a lot of um, word of mouth recommendation as well. Um, I yes. think back in the days, that was just really also how it helped you business even more so I think than today, because now we focus more on online marketing. So yes. it just, it just helped having that front shop. And people walking in and learning more about what you do. And mm. because the, my concept was quite unique, especially for the Gold Coast, and the setup was quite unique as well. So um, I got featured in different publications as well, like MasterChef yeah. Melbourne wrote about it. So people will come from Melbourne, like, oh, I needed to come and see your teacups on the wall. So it, uh, it really helped that it was a bit of a different concept as well. Oh, sounds amazing. Mm. And so why did you not stick with it over there? Well, then there was love. <laughs> 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 then there was love. So my husband lived on the West Coast. I lived on the East Coast. And we thought, well, what do we do? Is he going to break everything up and move into my life? Or do I give everything up and move into his life? Yes. And I've done that once before. <laughs> and right. it ended in tears so we thought well why don't we start somewhere from scratch and there will never be any resentment we just both have a fresh start together we can build together and that really made sense at the time so we decided well maybe we're done with Australia for the time being so let's look at the other countries and um, yeah we, we picked Hong Kong so we moved to Hong Kong and that meant um, soul of the cafe he finished up he works in corporate so he got a job there and off we went to Hong Kong so yeah I, I'm not sure if I still would have the cafe now because it was a lot of hard work I mean it's I think you know ca mm. having a cafe is like romantic dreaming it's, it's like yes. it'll be really nice but it's really hard work of course <laughs> so yeah. um yeah we um we just decided I would finish everything up and he would as well and we moved to Hong Kong together and then a part of me was like, okay, well, what's next? Yeah. You know, I thought, well, maybe I could get back into health foods again and maybe work in that. But um, yeah, it just, it just went back to doing therapy work, doing coaching. So I started building my coaching business. And then we also, um, after the first year, I started building my coaching business again, doing it all online because before it was all in person. And then I opened up a health retreat in Hong Kong. So I offered coaching and people would come and stay the night and they could have yoga with yoga teachers. So that was my next business adventure. Okay, so I'm, I'm a tiny <laughs> little bit confused now. <laughs> now. Let me ask the first know, question that's on my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What attracted you to Hong Kong? Mm -hmm. Why well, I've never Kong? been. I've never been. I've never been. And we looked at Brazil. We looked at um, Thailand. And they all sounded really wonderful. And my husband was going for my husband's job. So for me, I knew I probably would just start a business doing something and yes. we thought Hong Kong would make sense because of the language so right. for me to be able to start something there and it was a good decision I've never been I was like why not I'm open let's do it right. so we, we we went and had a look I was like yep yeah, I think I can live here so we moved you're very adventurous aren't you in that <laughs> respect I mean, yeah. I would have had to be very, very sure about that. You know, that's a, I mean, that's a big cultural change. I mean, was it already independent at that time? Hong Kong, was it independent from the UK then? Yeah, the, yeah, 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 it already it was. was. Already. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, oh, wow, fantastic. Okay, mm. so you just went, right? Yeah. Incredible. Mm -hmm. And then setting up the business so tell tell me again mm -hmm. what you you said you decided to do coaching mm -hmm. well if yeah. you do coaching you have to study coaching you've got to get yeah. a diploma or a coaching qualification mm -hmm. right so yeah did you do all that as well in hong kong yeah i when i just as i was transitioning out of australia to hong kong i did do that and um so it was just to get the structural basis. I mean, doing what I've done before, 
already yes. gave me a bit of an idea because I would do psychic readings and energy healing and all of that. So I was yes. talking to people already all day long, but there was desire instead of me telling them that it would feel better to coach them and actually allow them to get their own answers versus me telling them what they should be doing next or what I feel would be aligned for them. So yes. I did do that. And um, yeah, so that was then, that then moved into life coaching. And right. um, I did that for quite a while along with the health retreat, which, which was an, a year later. So it was a combination mm -hmm. of people coming to stay. I would help them figure out what to do with their lives. So I had to find deeper inner happiness or how to feel more connected to themselves. They will come and stay the night and have some healthy food. So I did that. And yeah, I built it also, also start to build my online coaching business along the way as well. And I did that till five years ago because I noticed there was a trend that people would come to me mostly for love. <laughs> Even when they were coming to my personal healing sessions in the cafe, they would always ask me, when will I meet the one? Will I stay in the relationship? Oh, yeah. We're no longer being intimate. I'm not sure what to do. Should I stay? Should I go? And I just noticed love was always one of the biggest topics, like love yeah. and career, but usually love first. Yes. <laughs> and I felt that, you know, as I was coaching, I felt like, yeah, um, you know, I can coach you because it is about you but I also felt that I was lacking more in-depth knowledge about relationship and also about intimacy because a lot of people come to me as well especially in Hong Kong I'm having an affair or my partner's having an affair and it was something that I felt I wasn't necessarily really well enough equipped to really understand the depth the root problems of, of affairs or sexuality or intimacy. So I went to, I went to study that and I became certified in that. And right. then that and how, I've been to. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. How do you get certified in that? Yeah. So there are courses out there that you can mm -hmm. take? Yeah. That training certifications. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I um, found, um, found something that really spoke to me and. Right. I thought that makes a lot of sense and I liked what they were teaching and I also liked that it's helped me right, <laughs> yes. most and foremost. So I went with that. Yeah. And then that really changed my business. It really allowed me to find my passion yes. and my business has just been evolving from there. And yeah, it's, 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 it's beautiful work. I feel like it's needed work because I, most of us are in relationships in one way or the other. Most yes. of us want to be intimate, whether it's with ourselves or with somebody else. And yes. it's something that we don't really talk about. Sometimes we can feel quite alone in it. And I feel like we should talk about it more. So I became quite passionate to give people the opportunity to receive the support that they seek in that because you can feel quite alone. Yeah. Oh, wow. Amazing. And um this you set this up in hong kong did you mm -hmm. yeah 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 and um just a, a thing you mentioned that i didn't get completely straight in my mind and if i don't get it straight maybe the listeners don't either mm -hmm. the, the health retreat was a physical mm -hmm. space that people yeah. came to so yeah did you have to rent a space or was it in your home or where how did that work the actual retreat bit yeah, so we were really lucky. We found this beautiful place in Hong Kong. You wouldn't even think that it really exists. Um, it had a private beach. It was in one of the islands. So we had to get on a ferry to get to. So we lived there and we had some rooms set up that with en suites that people could come and stay and practice yoga and just to really retreat from the city because the city is quite intense. Yes. Um, it's high population, it's very mm. fast paced. So people could have a getaway and just to, just to be and to connect with themselves more, be surrounded by nature, by the jungle. So it was relatively close to the ferry pier, but we were also secluded as well where we didn't really have any neighbors. So it was very, very wow. special for Hong Kong. Wow. Okay. Got it. Got it. And do you still have it now or not? No, 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 we're I'm in Spain right now, so okay. no. 
<laughs> okay, well, okay, we'll come back to Spain. Right. Okay, so and did you do the coaching from mm -hmm. your retreat place as well, face to face? Yeah, online? face to face and online, both. Yeah, mm -hmm. both. Yeah, right. both. Okay, so what happened next then? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and here I am five years later and still doing the coaching. It's it's mostly online. Um, yeah. Pre-COVID, I would travel and hold retreats or workshops internationally, but that's become a bit harder. So it's it's pretty much all online Yeah, and still loving it very much. Brilliant. Hmm. And... This is this is mainly work that you do one on one with people, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I do one on one and couples as well. Oh, of course, yeah. Okay, yeah. understood. Yeah, and group coaching and as well. So right now I'm running a group coaching program. So, but it's for women only, and um, yeah. So I offer that as well. Okay, brilliant. Mm. And so, tell us a little bit about if you're able to, you mm -hmm. know what. What are some of the significant things that you've discovered? You've been doing it for five years now, mm. correct? Yeah, four years I studied and then yeah, for four years. Yeah, four years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you've spoken to a lot of people on coached mm -hmm. a lot of people in that time, I'm sure, mm -hmm. and couples and, and so are there any trends like themes or things that you notice that keep repeating? across you know people <laughs> what have you noticed natalie mm -hmm. well yeah i mean pff, there's so many <laughs> <laughs> there is so many i think one of i mean i have realized that our upbringing has really got a huge impact on the way how we relate with others so yes seeing our parents relating with each other because it's the first people we learn from and how did they show love to themselves and to each other yeah. and we learn from them and um also how did they show love to us has a yes. huge impact as well in the way how we are then giving love and receiving love from others and the world so that is just and it's something that I always look at with, with everybody that I coach because we need to understand how are we actually receiving and how are we giving love? Because yeah. it, if we are not having our needs met, then usually it's there's something inside of ourselves that maybe we might have had a lack of when we were growing up that we're able just not to open up or we're blocking it or we're not maybe asking for it the right way so it's really important that we are looking at that and something else i've noticed is actually that a lot of people they they want to receive love or they want to feel love but a lot of them also have a really hard time to receive love fully to really yes. be loved and even though I would say loving, love from others can sometimes be a lot kinder than we can love ourselves. So yes. I just want to repeat that. So the love from others can sometimes be a lot, of, a lot kinder than we are actually loving ourselves. Yes. So the, the tricky part is to actually really receive it because sometimes somebody can give you such a nice compliment, but you're not yes. really receiving it. So I feel like a lot of us, a common theme is that we are somewhere holding back from experiencing the love or the intimacy that we desire. We might really long for it, but there's yes. usually a reason back from childhood that's actually blocking us from receiving or experiencing that. So that's a really common block. Another real common block when it comes to intimacy is that after about 18 months to two years, when there is a chemical hormone called PEA, that tends to drop. So at first you meet somebody, you're full of passion, you're full of desire, you can't keep your hands off each other. But after about two years, that tends to drop. So I notice a lot of relationships become more comfortable and sex doesn't necessarily mean it becomes bad, but often it becomes more Frequent, less frequent and it yeah. can become more comfortable because we just tend to stick to what we know and with time then we go like well you know first we had all this hormone fueled sex and it was really amazing but now I'm maybe craving a little bit more so we also might find ourselves not experiencing what it is that we really want because yeah. when we are fueled by hormones everything feels so much better <laughs> yes. so 
But if Tommy also might know as well, actually, hang on, maybe there's a different type of touch I desire, or maybe there's a different way I would like my partner to initiate for me to actually experience pleasure. So we start to notice these things after about two years. And I see this really, really common when people come to me, well, you know, just no longer the same. And it's like, well, yeah, there's a reason for that. Because sometimes we go like, well, what's wrong? But there yeah. is reasons for that. And often we don't have the tools to support ourselves or support the relationship to be, to make it be what we actually want it to be so what you're saying then i'm try, i'm paraphrasing a little bit and i'm i'm no expert at this whatsoever mm -hmm. but um you're saying there is there's a chemical that mm -hmm. takes place in the beginning when you have all of that desire the passion the lust that takes place and that then kind of reduces over time. Mm -hmm. And instead of doing things differently, everybody, or not everybody, but there, there is a expectation that things should be how they used to be, and they're mm. not anymore. Mm. And that yeah. people have really need to be looking for other ways of keeping it alive really keeping yeah, that exactly. relationship alive yeah uh, exactly other than expecting it to go back to how it was before because it can't be because the chemical isn't there anymore it's reduced yeah. over time so yeah. it's a physiological thing and I, I don't think people necessarily know about that do they no no because we just wonder what's happening and you know because intimacy and sex is such a taboo topic and often we find it really hard to discuss with the person that we are intimate with so mm -hmm. we're not even having these conversations we just tend to slowly drift away mm -hmm. and often if we do have the conversation it's also a tricky one to have because we don't want to hurt each other's feelings we don't want to upset the other person we might even experience some personal shame to talk about it so mm -hmm. a lot is at play that actually affects our intimacy with others and we're not yeah. aware and that's that's the thing that's what we you know where do we learn about it i mean we where <laughs> school we don't learn about pleasure um pornography yeah. well it gives us a little bit of an idea of what you know pleasure could be but it's not really the real pleasure that actually is available to us so no. yeah we sometimes can feel a bit stuck and a bit alone and just like okay well now there's like this elephant in the room how do we how do we reconnect and it really yes. is just a matter of learning and staying curious and because we thrive by novelty so we need to stay being curious so we can rediscover and our body is such an amazing i don't know what you want it's just it's so amazing that there's so much it can feel that we're not even aware of so there's always there's always more to learn there's always more to discover and it's yeah. not just inside the bedroom it's just about outside the bedroom as well like we constantly evolve we constantly grow so we also need to stay keeping curious if the person that we're with and you know what's happening how have you evolved and where are you at now and mm -hmm. i think we tend to work so much on our career and everything else in life that we just put so much energy into but when it comes to our relationship it's because it's there yes. <laughs> we we stop staying curious we, yes. we just become comfortable yeah 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 i mean yeah it's uh i've i've heard a lot of people talk about this um specifically tony robbins i'm sure you're familiar with with sage you know they talk about it that's that's his wife sage and you know they they have a um, they ha I, some years ago now i watched their whole dvd series around this mm -hmm. and it all made so much sense mm -hmm. but it's one thing kind of uh, intellectually understanding it, mm -hmm. there is another thing actually putting it into practice, yeah, um, and learning how to do that. So, yeah. and it, and you're right, nobody learns this anywhere, mm. and therefore it's not surprising. I don't know what the stats, stats are anymore because I don't follow them, but. That's why so many relationships fail. I'm not just talking marriage. I'm talking relationships yeah. per yeah. se, mm. because I've even seen it in my stepsons. You know, 
mm. they have relationships with girls and it stops uh, mm. or they get back together again and then it breaks up again and then back together and they break up again mm. and it, it might not always be about the intimate intimacy mm. but it might just be about intimacy on an intellectual level as mm. well so and i suppose again i tell me if i've got this wrong but it's if intellectually you've got to start with it at some place intellectually because you've got to have the courage to even start inquiring about it mm. <laughs> start opening the conversation about it and i think mm. anyway in in past experience <laughs> that's the hardest bit there is there's is no mm. question about it it's actually starting the conversation yeah i agree i agree and i think that's another thing we don't learn how do we even have these conversations on how so somebody can actually hear us <laughs> yes. i think a lot of times we don't even feel heard or we don't you know we just because we have maybe if we haven't had our emotional needs or intimate needs met usually resentment builds up over time Mm. And then we either we withdraw and we don't talk about it. And then maybe at some point we, it might come up in a fight or it just yes. might explode at some point. And yes. <clears throat> usually when that happens, there's no way the other person can hold that because all they hear is blame. <laughs> and to just sit down and then also making sure that the, that the conversation doesn't create go into an argument either is also hard so uh, you know i feel like it's also important that we do have the right communication tools so we can our express ourselves honestly and vulnerably and also that the other person hears us and doesn't come from a place of it's all blame or i failed yes. or i'm not good enough because it's very easy just to go like yeah oh i am are you are you are you blaming me right now because sometimes when we use certain words or a certain dialogue it can come across as, as blame so it is important that we also learn how to communicate and um something that i help my clients like okay how can we have these tricky conversations that mm -hmm. you can speak your truth but it actually doesn't come across as blame to the other person so they can actually hear you <laughs> yes. and not yeah. withdraw so yeah it's 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 really important so i agree with your conversation and and you know you spoke earlier that we can have all these knowledge and i agree we can we can study and learn but at the end of the day we also need to feel it we need to mm -hmm. feel it in our body we need to feel it in our body in, in our being so a lot of things so i usually show my clients how to communicate and then also how to embody it because sometimes we can have all the all conversations like I have conversations with my husband and I can tell him the same thing a million times and it just he hears it but he's not feeling it right. <laughs> and you know we're staying in this rut so what I've learned in myself and also what I'm helping people is how can we actually express in an embodied way because we can maybe talk about it and learn about it and understand have awareness there but if mm -hmm. you're not necessarily feeling the breakthrough or feeling the experience then it just doesn't nothing really changes so for example if i'm if i'm upset about something instead of using like okay, i really need to sit down and i tell him let's just say like you know he keeps putting his glass on on on, on the table without putting a little coaster down just for example yeah. and he's like oh you just keep just can you just put you know coaster down and maybe i need to tell him 10 20 times and he just keeps forgetting not because he wants to hurt me it's just that no. somehow in his nervous system and is in his mind he just doesn't Indeed. think it's really important and just yeah. forgets mm. so here i am probably my deeper stories doesn't care about me i'll probably go just get upset about that but then my deeper stories were like oh he doesn't care about me he doesn't even want mm. he doesn't he doesn't care about me so mm. i will yeah. project that most likely in one way or the other and i keep telling him can you just you know maybe i get a bit anger maybe i try to ask sweetly but for some reason he doesn't hear it so mm. if i also tell him you know what be really helpful to me is if you put a coaster down because that will help me to feel really cared for and then also maybe i just tell him if there's like a general i mean it's a superficial thing but if it's just like mm. just maybe just tell him like 
and I show him in an embodied expression <laughs> how yes. frustrating or how painful or how sad that makes me. Yeah. And when I'm showing it in my whole being, he can feel it because otherwise he just hears words and probably told me that's like, oh, that's nagging. <laughs> yes. I mean, who knows what he hears, but you know, he just. Yeah. But if he, usually when he can feel in my expression, I really show him how it makes me feel and the importance of it. And I make mm. a request. It's amazing. Then he's like, oh, yeah. Oh, I had no idea that was so important to you. Of course, if that's how you feel. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. I had no idea. So having these tools really make a difference because I yeah. feel supported. He feels like he can serve me. He can support me in that. And, and, and that's, that really has been a huge relationship game changer for me and, and for others as well. Just having that communication and being more in our authentic expression and showing the other person what's going on versus holding back, holding back, and then maybe through passive aggression, maybe slam a door, maybe it will come charging out some point later. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, so that's been fascinating. That was so helpful to, you know, show, albeit a very silly example, hmm. but I think sometimes it's through those silly things that things blow up between mm. people who are in relationships together. Yeah. And it could be literally that little thing that just, you know, explodes. Yeah. Because as you said, there's been a buildup of tension over mm. a period of time where neither party has wanted to really say what they would like to say. Yeah. And they don't know how to say it in a way, as you said, so that it can be felt rather than just heard or not heard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's important that we also under, our, understand ourselves in that. Hence, I was talking in the beginning, we need to learn <clears throat> about ourselves more as well. Um, what are our deeper triggers? What are our deeper wounds? So right now I'm being really mm -hmm. triggered by you not putting the course down, but there's probably, if I am being triggered, that's also mm -hmm. telling me there's something else that I probably need to look at yes. because maybe a part of me feels really neglected. Mm -hmm. Maybe a part of me has always felt Maybe, maybe my parents didn't really listen to me when I needed them to listen, for example. Yes. So yes. that could just me projecting the not being listened to onto my husband. So I'm like, you're never listening to me, you're not listening to what I've got to say, you don't hear me. So yes. that can also come out, me being triggered and projecting all of that onto him. So mm. letting him, that's my stuff I need to work on, but I can also ask him for support. It would be really helpful and doing it in a way that he can hear me, that he actually wants to help me is really yeah. important. So it's self-responsibility, mm. but then also ex allowing others to also come in and, and love us and support us. Yeah, I, th I, th it's, I, I totally concur with your mentioning kind of past conditioning that comes up for us. Mm. And I've been doing some research on that myself for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in holistic therapies. I, I trained in, in a few myself over the years. Mm -hmm. I don't practice them today, but I'm, I'm, um, a let's call it a lifelong learner about the human mind and the human mm -hmm. body. And, um, I was studying a, a concept by in Buddhism called independent no, dependent, not independent, dependent mm -hmm. origination. I don't mm -hmm. know if you come across it at all. It's one mm -hmm. of the eight noble truths that uh, Buddha taught. And in there, the like 12 cycles around conditioning, really, and how we respond because of what our conditioning from mm. being very, very young. Mm. And, and noticing that in order to reduce it is mm -hmm. quite tricky. And, mm -hmm. and you quite rightly mentioning these examples, you know, maybe as a child, I wasn't listened to, and that can be conditioned over time, having that mm -hmm. feeling mm -hmm. that I'm not listened to, and that will show up everywhere. It might not be your partner. It might be 
your boss or yeah. your friend or you know the person on the customer service line that's not hearing what you've got to say about yeah. your complaint so yeah it's it's a fascinating area of human mind <laughs> and, yeah and what we hold on to for the rest of our lives yeah absolutely it really is and i something i am um, I talk about in my coaching as well, which has really been like just even I look at protective roles. Mm. So I like to call them protective roles. So we could have maybe protective roles like the independent, good girl, good boy, rescuer, caretaker, lone wolf. <clears throat> and, you know, these are all roles that we naturally are and embody and that we carry. Yes. But sometimes they can be... Um, amplified so they can be over functioning or under functioning mm -hmm. and maybe like in an in an, an over functioning protective role of let's say a man was the caretaker for a long time i would just wanting to caretake of everybody let me let me take let me take care of you and but mm -hmm. my my wound was then i was like well nobody's taking care of me yes <laughs> that was my story so i had to work with that and mm -hmm. Um, it's it's important that we, that we realize because I feel like a lot of the time in relationships we also show up in our in our protective role role mate roles so instead of soulmates sometimes we can come in as role mates so my husband would be the avoidant and I was the caretaker so I'd be like let me care take caretake of you and he'd be like oh great well Nat's doing everything so I don't really have to do much <laughs> and. <laughs> You know, I was encouraging his not having to step in or not having to open up because I would just, you know, create this environment where I'd be like nurturing, taking care of everything and just being that caretaker. And I thought I was doing a great job, but I also yes. realized it was just not serving either of us. So I had to right. do a lot of work. And what happened then is it started to balance and polarize our relationship in a lot healthier way. So it yes. is important that we look at those protective roles is they they stem from they stem from childhood because yes. um, not receiving or experiencing in a certain moment or in certain environments where we not really I felt like I had to do something so my parents would see the attention and then they would you know give me the attention that I desired yes. so it yes. it fueled that role and deep down I was not having my needs met mm. because I just wanted to. I thought, well, the more love I give, then, you know, hopefully I'll give something back. But it was not, it was not being me authentic. So I need, no. I, I had to work on that. So, yeah, it, it's, it's very fascinating and important to know if we're not experiencing the love that we desire, if we're not experiencing the intimacy desire, but again, mm. where am I blocking myself? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you quite rightly say it starts with, ourselves doesn't it mm. rather than looking at the other person we've got to examine our own behavior our own conditioning our own yeah stuff <laughs> first that's where yeah. it has to start yeah 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 fascinating and how do people you know get started um i mean how do you even how do you even get people interested <laughs> in wanting to do to kind of deal with it you know mm. yeah i mean there has to be a willingness there because you know ignorance can be quite blissful <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but also um i think when people realize deeper down i want more deeper down i'm not having my needs met deeper down i do want to experience a relationship that i desire i do want to experience a sex life that i desire i do want to mm. experience more fullness and more riches in my life because yeah. i can see i'm blocking somewhere i can see there's a pattern people will mm. then realize you know what yeah i know there can be more so that's when they're usually wanting because there's a desire there i always yeah. feel like if there's a desire and we're ready to experience that desire that's usually when people reach out to me so, yeah, and I usually take them on a journey. It's like first understanding, then yeah. there is a healing process. Then we look at, you know, what is my desire? And then we create a transformation process to get them to where they want to be. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And 
is it then a maintenance as well after that or is it a case, on a case by case basis where people kind of go well, okay we're going to try something out and then we'll come back to you and say well we've got blockages or we're stuck or yeah i mean you know everybody's very different so some people they will feel like right like i'm feeling this is really i'm feeling really good and um, i've experienced what i wanted to experience and i mean there's always more i mean life there's always more there's always yes. more some people yes. feel like yeah this 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 has been great some people feel like yeah you know i'm ready for this next thing or some people say they want to come back later or some people want to continue on some people just like to have the continuous support because they yes. just like to be coached they want to have somebody that's there to hold space and to guide them and support them so it really is an individual case but normally it's a minimum of a three-month journey because right. I work with the nervous system as well. So I know, again, in order to feel, we can know things. But if you really want to feel it, it does take time. So it's usually a minimum of a three-month journey where we go there. I'm here to support you. I'm here to guide you and, yeah, walk you on that path to your desire. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting that you say three months. I, I have this theory um, that when people have let's say some illness in their body physical mm -hmm. physical illness and they have to be treated for that or they've had an injury and they have mm -hmm. to be treated for that i i and i don't know how this is just like an intuition really i've seen it happen mm -hmm. to somebody specifically they were in hospital for three months and then they came out I wouldn't say 100% healed, but healed enough to go back into life, if you know what I mean. Mm. And I believe there is that kind of, I don't know what it is, 13 weeks, let's call it a quarter or whatever of the year, where mm. people seem to get to a point of being healed, um, yeah. where they can, you know, go go back into life again. So, yeah. yeah, fascinating three months. I, I think you're 100% right on that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. It's not a weekend. It's not a, you know, one, two, three sessions. It's, it's, it's like this continuous kind of tapping away on it um, so that it becomes, you know, a, a, con a new conditioned response. Yeah, exactly. Healthy. Yeah, it takes time because we have to remember we've been like this for maybe many years when I talk to people. It's like, so how long have you been feeling that way? Oh, a long time. Great. All my life. Yeah. <laughs> All my life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, this is, it, you know, it's not just a magic pill we can take. We have to, especially if we work with the nerves, it takes time to rewire. We can learn and we have the awareness, but again, feeling it, it takes mm. time. It takes mm. time. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. This is really, really fascinating. And I, I genuinely could talk more about this topic, but I, I, I guess I would need to sign up to your program <laughs> in order to do so. Um, how can people get in touch with you, Natalie, if, if any of this resonated with them and they, they want to come on your program? Yeah. So you can um, reach me on my website, which is my full name. So it's nataliesummer.com. And I've also got a quiz on there. So if you want to learn more about um, your Eros archetype, then you can take the quiz there. We'll tell you more about your intimacy and the way how you're wired. And also I run um, group coaching programs as well that usually go for four months so it's also a transformative journey if, if a group of women come together it's called whole magnetic her so it's really about you stepping into your wholeness into your magnetism and just really looking at all aspects of what it means to be a woman of today and i also have got a private facebook group called eros temple for the modern woman and in there are the lots of content creation videos facebook lives that they're just open to anybody that would like to join Fantastic. Well, I'm sure people will be checking this out when they listen to this. It's been a real pleasure hearing your story and all the amazing work you're doing. So thank you so much for your time. And if, if you do come to the UK at any point in the future, do let me know. Yeah. And if, 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 if the stars are aligned and we can meet up somewhere for a coffee or a bite to eat, I'd, I'd love to do that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd love that. That'd be really nice to see you in person. And yeah. thank you so much for having me and for allowing me to share my story. It, yeah, it was really a pleasure talking with you today. Brilliant, Natalie. Take care. All the best for now. Thank you. Same to you. Thanks, Michael. Bye. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.